what is the asymmetric? Uh, everyone knows what the traveling salesman problem is, right? You're given a graph, and um, you want to find a loop, which visits all the vertices in the graph. If the graph that was given to you was a directed graph, yeah, so uh, let's say that. Of course, this is not even strongly connected, so let's put some other edges. Let's assume that there is no there's a loop. Now, if this is asymmetric if uh, these edge weights are different or not necessarily the same. Right? So that's the asymmetric value is a problem. And uh, as before, we want to find a tool which is its uh, on the vertices and has the minimum possible cost. <coughs> uh, what is known about this problem, or what was known about this problem, uh, is a simple log in approximation. That I will be able to show you quite easily. And then, uh, so this is almost folklore. Then this was improved to a log n, or a log log n. This was also considered a major breakthrough because this log n was uh, <coughs> uh, was uh, uh, was there for a very long time and no one could take improve it. So then there's this very tiny improvement, but very nice ideas for <coughs> thin trees and stuff like that. We're not going to any of that today. And then um, there's a lot of work. So this is, so this was a paper by I don't remember all the authors, but there was Michel Niemann on it, and uh, uh, Oasis, and a bunch of other people. <coughs> uh, this introduced this idea of thin trees, and then there was a lot of work on trying and improving the bounds for thin trees. And uh, that didn't lead to any improvement in the asymmetric density approximation ratio of the work. And then finally, uh, last year, uh, we got this other one approximation by Sinclair by Sensor Dunlopy and Lashley Bay. And um, this was based on on, uh, on a result of Svensson, which uh, uh, which was for what's called node weighted uh, matrix. So I, I, I talked about uh, many of these things. Now this is uh, these are very involved papers, right? So there's no way I can do any justice in even four or five hours time. So I will, in 45 minutes, try to give you some important ideas and hopefully motivate you to uh, be able to go into some of them. Right? Please stop me if you have any questions. Each step, 
I will be having the number of vertices at least because each cycle would be a bit at least two. And so the number of times I have to repeat is only log n, and that's what gives you the log n approximation. Right? So this was uh, folklore, this was there for uh, many, many years since this problem was perhaps first identified. And uh, <clears throat> I told you about this because some of these ideas also get used in uh, these results. So uh, before I proceed further, I have to, and, and the other idea is, of course, um, uh, this result is going to be arguing that uh, one can build a door. So now instead of a door, we'll always think of an Eulerian subgraph. I can find an Eulerian subgraph connected, so we want to find a connected Eulerian subgraph of weight less than, or of length in minutes, length less than, Order one and so Okay. <clears throat> Why is it okay to consider Eulerian subgraphs and not those? Because we are always uh, we do have the metric property. What does the metric property say? So in our Eulerian subgraph, you visit a vertex multiple times. So once the first time you visit, it's okay. The next time you visit, you can always short circuit, right? You can always take this and thereby get a two log. So this would be <coughs> only less than the sum of these two lengths. And so that's a standard thing. You use, that's how you use the metric property and all the uh, algorithms. So the next time you come to that vertex, you just solve it. So it's okay to talk about all the classes, okay? Connected all the And uh, here would be, this is the classic linear program, like I did in for uh, formulating this. Uh, so if I put integrality restrictions, so uh, let's, let's go over this very quickly. So I associate a variable x e with a d h. Think of it as if this variable is one and that edge is included in the origin subgraph. It's zero, it's not. So that would be an integer formulation. So clearly you want to minimize the length of the edges which are included. So that would be a d x e. And now, because it's oriented, you want that the total number of edges Incident at a vertex in degree equals the out degree. So that's <coughs> delta minus is the set of edges incident to a vertex, uh, coming into a vertex, delta plus is going out, and delta is just the union of these two sets. So you want that this, this notation is just saying that the sum of the x values that are assigned to these edges equals the sum of the x values that are assigned to those edges. <coughs> okay, and then this ensures connectivity. If you just have this, then um, you will just get cycle covers. So this is to ensure connectivity, right? You want uh, one, one cycle cover, so you want to connect it the inside. Right? What is this saying? That if I look at any cut in the graph, right? so if this is S, then you want to say that uh, incoming edges and outgoing edges for this set should sum to at least one. Which is the same as saying that the if I look at all the edges of the set, Right? The sum of their x values is at least two. Okay, and these are these are equivalent ways of thinking of it because if uh, because it's oriented because of this condition, then uh, if the total going out of a set is let's say two point five, then there will be one point two five coming in and one point two five going out. <coughs> so this would be the linear program, and um, we have removed the integrality constraints. Of course, we can solve this linear program, and. Uh, yeah, I have to introduce the dual here. Many of you don't remember how to write the dual, so uh, believe me that this is the right dual. What is this saying? This is saying that, uh, so remember, uh, the, let's say there is this multiplier. This is the dual variable corresponding to this constraint. Let's call it phi v and the known potential. And then the dual is, uh, so here we have variables only for edges. So there will be the dual constraints only for edges. And this is saying, that the difference in the potential across an edge, so take an edge, <coughs> uv, so pi u, pi v, pi u minus pi v, plus let me look at all the sets. So uh, uh, the other dual variable is a value assigned to the sets, right? So this is, this is what you have said this here. There is a variable associated with this constraint. <coughs> so there is a dual variable assigned to various sets by S1, by S2. So look at all the sets that are going across this edge. Um, 
So remember there is set and there are edges going across it. Um, so in the primal we said that the sum of these x values should be at least two. In the dual we are this set will contribute towards the towards this edge. Uh, there could be other sets contributing towards this edge, which looks like that. And you want to say that the sum of the dual variables of all those sets plus the difference in potential is at most the length of the edge. Okay, for those of you who are seeing this for the first time, it might look a bit intimidating. But don't worry too much about it. <coughs> um, we'll, we'll simplify this very soon. And uh, that's uh, one of the ideas of the paper. Questions? Okay. Now, so the first uh, thing we're going to do is uh, redefine the, rate, the length of the edges. So L. So now let me define L prime, the length of an edge as. Uh, its original length minus pi u plus pi u. Okay. So I've changed the length of the edges. What have I done? I have taken the original length and reduced it by the difference of potential. Why have I done that? Now, with this new length, if you look at this dual constraint, what does that mean? This will just be equal to now the sum of the dual variables crossing this edge. Right? 
we are heavily using the fact that it's all different. So if not, it will remain unattended. So independent of multiplying if it was X is, it will still remain things we just cancel. Okay, so that's the first point. Now the second thing is, so we work with this new net function. Uh, the next point is that if I look at the optimum solution to this dual linear program, it actually has a nice property. So dual LP solution. So what does that mean? So we're working rid of these pipes already, right? By redefining the new net, uh, new net function. Now let me look at these, these sets by S, which have a value more than zero. Right? That's what these are the two things we define the dual linear programming solution. The pies which you got rid of, the bits which you got rid of, and <coughs> these. And you know, you could have an arbitrary collection of sets with uh, bias greater than zero. But what is known is that this has a nice property. If you have two crossing sets of this kind, you can uncross them. Like what does that mean? Suppose this bias value was 0.3, this was 0.3, let's say. Then I can replace it with, so, um, okay, there's two, two things first. One is, which are the sets for which bias is greater than zero? So if bias is greater than zero, then that is a tight set. Then summation x e, e belonging to delta s is exactly equal to this. Again, complementary slackness. So we are just playing with complementary slackness, right? So if this dual variable corresponding to this got a non-zero value, then this constraint should have been tight. Right? So if a set got value more than zero, then there was exactly two units of xc across the set, which means one unit coming in and one unit going out. Because it's only the solution that we are working with is a one unit solution. Right? So now, simplify this picture a bit. So if this is a set with bias greater than zero, and this is a set with bias greater than zero, then that means that this is this is going to be called a tight set. We we'll call this a tight set. So this is a tight set. It means that the total x value across the set is two, and the total x value across the set is also two. One can argue very easily that that means that this will also be a tight set, and this will also be a tight set. Like this is a standard sum modularity argument. So this would be a tight set and this would also be a tight set. So tight would mean that the sum of the x values across this would be 2 and the sum of x values across this would also be 2. And so what we are going to do is, so if both of them have the same 0.3 value, then I can replace, put the 0.3 in this manner. And thereby what have I achieved? I have achieved that the dual value sits on sets which are not crossing each other. Okay. If they were different, you might say, okay, oh, not may not be 0.3 and 0.3, this could be 0.3 and 0.4, then what would I do? I would put this 0.3, I would put this set and an additional 0.1, and this whole thing would again be a 0.3. So you can play uh, such things, such games, and thereby what you get is, okay, so I if you do not completely follow this. Let me nevertheless say what the final statement is, and you will believe that. Uh, so the final statement here is that you can get a laminar collection of sets. Let's call this collection script L uh, with non-zero dual values. Why do we want this? Okay, what is the laminar collection going to look like? It will say that these two sets have uh, a non-zero dual value. So it will look like that. Right, so I'm only drawing the sets which have non zero which have bias greater than strictly greater than zero. And now why is this good for us? Why is this good for us? Remember, I changed the length function so that the new length function value for the, so I change the length function, remember, so L prime uv is equal to summation y s, s such that e belongs to the s. So this was greater than or equal to in general, but it was equality for those edges which for which x e is non-zero. So if x e is greater than zero, again the complementary 
flatness, then the new length function is exactly equal to that quantity for those edges. So that's what we are going to do. Keep only those edges for which x is greater than zero. Forget about the others. Why? The LP is not using it. I'm also not going to use it. Right? So we only have those edges in the graph for which x is greater than zero. For those edges, the length of the edge is now this nice. So it's not an arbitrary length. So initially, the lengths that were given to us were sort of arbitrary. Of course, they satisfied nice and equality, but we had no other control on the lengths of the edges. But now we do have. Right? So for instance, if this is 3, this is 2, this is 4, this is 6, these are the dual values that I put in. And if there is an edge going from here to here, what do I know about the length of this edge? It will be 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 6. Exactly. One question. Yeah. So this uh, arc crossing algorithm, what is the algorithm? I mean, you start with a dual, which might be exponentials, or do they grow the balls? Uh, no, no, no. So how many dual variables will oh, be? Oh, I see, I see. Only you saw this linear program. program. And there will be only a small number of dual variables which will be non-zero. And then you will do the crossing procedure on that. Right? And, uh, and then you get this correction. And this correction is important for its algorithm. So actually it is important that you get the primal and the dual solution. So you got this correction now. And now the length of every edge. So the nice thing about this correction is that, one nice thing is that the length of every edge can just now be break off from the, from the values that you have. So in some sense, uh, which of n squared different lengths or n different lengths possible, now the length can be is captured through the values assigned to these n different sets. There could be only n sets in this lambda equation. Yeah. So is it that the vertices are somehow input on a tree and <coughs> Yeah, so this lambda collection can be thought of as a tree. You can make and now an edge which goes across two parts of the tree, so its length is just the length of the tree. Of course that interpretation is not used, but if you can think of it in that. More questions? Okay. Good. Now, <clears throat> what are we going to do with this? So, one idea is just the following that you take one of these sets and you shake it. Okay? And then you just solve the problem in the remaining graph. The final non-linear subgraph in the remaining graph. Now the issue would be, okay, suppose you were able to solve the problem in the remaining graph, what will you do when you unshift? How will you connect things back up? Right? And uh, okay, so the idea there is that or or once you shrink, okay, so so what they do is uh, They would okay. so they would take one of these sets, and I'd say which of these sets they would take, and say suppose they decide to shrink it. Right. So before shrinking, they will figure out. So these are the edges that are coming. So remember, the only edges that I am considering now are those edges which have exceed greater than zero. Right. So these are the only edges I need to play with. What they're going to do is they're going to find out the all find the shortest path between here and here in this in this part of the graph and between between every pair of incoming and outgoing, entering, entering and exit points. Okay. So and look at the maximum. So uh, the worst way to go across this set. They compute that. You understand what the worst way is? See, why, why is the worst way? Because after I shrink it and I compute the solution in the remaining, I do not know which edge I'm going to take to come into this vertex and which edge I'm going to take to go out. And in fact, not just there will be one edge coming in and going out, there would be multiple edges, right? Remember, remember we are picking in one edge and so not just two. So I could have three edges coming in and three edges going out. So, and those then connections have to be extended within this thing. So they compute what's the worst way to go from 
to go across it, which means uh, from here to here compute, from here to here compute, all that computation can be done and take the maximum of all of those. So, this social relaxation, yeah. if the value that it's giving is much lower than the actual optimal solution, so the optimum had to be. Yes. So now, after you do this operation of shrinking, the old solution continues to be a feasible solution for the new instance. Yes, it does. So it is not as if you are refining your linear program so that it gives a higher value. No, you're not doing that. No, no, you're not. So, so, so you're not improving the linear program. You're not improving it. No. So the linear program will stay as is. Okay. You are arguing, in fact, this theorem, this paper argues that the gap, the integrality gap, is no more than a constant. So it's not very much worse off. In fact, the conjecture is that this is within two times the optimum. So this paper establishes a large constant. The conjecture is much stronger. Because, you know, that it's a very good gap. The idea is not as if the linear program was... No, you are trying to strengthen it. No. You are just taking that as a starting point. And now, what you would have said, you know, let me round this linear program, the solution. So basically, now we are doing this. Think of it as a round. Okay. This so whole thought, this is being done to figure out the rounding. Yeah, but the rounding, it's not rounding in the sense that I take an edge and it will be some very complicated thing. But this, all of this is now being done to build a solution, to build the audience itself. So you start with the linear program, or the solution to the linear, primary equal solution to the linear program, and then you use that to build the tool. Right? And you will argue that the cost of the tool is within a constant of the linear program value. So the linear program gave us a fraction of solution. Yes. And that was not good enough because we wanted it in Because we wanted it in So why is this shrinking going to be fine? How am, how am I going to build an integer solution? Yeah, good. So, I'm just trying to, uh, I'm trying to think of it as a divided compound, right? Suppose I had a way of, uh, um, suppose I could do, find the, the optimum, the best solution in the remaining graph, right? Uh, do I have now a way to extend? So, you know, maybe I can do this repeatedly, and then I get a smaller enough instance, and there I can find the optimum solution, the best solution. Then can I bring it back to the original graph? And that's what we've done. So you will compute what is the worst way to go across. Maybe for this it is some number 17, right? And so that's what you're going to do. Now you're going to take this, you're going to shrink it, and replace it with a single vertex. Right? This is this. So you replace it with a single vertex and give it this y value of 17. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that Okay, why am I giving it a y value of 17? Remember, when I, uh, when I build an Eulerian subgraph here, so think of the Eulerian subgraph as actually an Eulerian walk on the subgraph. When I enter a vertex, so what is the length of this edge? The length of this edge is the uh, sum of the lengths. We said it's sum of the lengths of the sets it is crossing, sum of the y values of the sets it's crossing. Right? Now, giving it a Giving it, giving this vertex a number 17, or giving this vertex a y value of 17, uh, means that I'm saying, I'm artificially saying that um, whatever solution I pick here, that will have the 17 in it, right? It will be able to pay for the connections that I need inside. I will pick a certain solution here. And I will be able to bound its cost. I'll say its total length is uh, uh, its total length is less than the uh, some some constant. I'll build a solution here and say its total length is less than or equal to some constant times the total y value of the sets, which is the dual or two times the y value of the sets. The same thing. I build that here, and now because I gave this 17, I have factored in here the fact that uh, I need to go across. Yeah, right. But see, here I am. Uh, I am not. So every time, so suppose there is. Okay. Suppose in the solution, I go through this twice. Right. I pick this edge as well as this. Side. So this is. So this seventeen is getting counted towards the length of all of these edges. <coughs> Right? So as many times as I go through this set, I'm actually already counted, counted for that through this mechanism, right? Because I already increased the length of this edge by a sense. Right? 
right? Remember the length of the stage is this 17 plus whatever it's getting from there. So it seems like uh, a clever idea to, uh, to kind of capture that, right? You, you are right, right? You might be going through that set 100 times, right? But then that means that in here, you uh, had 100 edges coming in and 100 edges going out. But you have accounted for all of that, right? When you put this number 17 here, because that 17 added to the length of all these 100 edges. And the total length of all of those edges you are training is less than the total value here. Some, let's say, 30 approximation, 30 times the total value here. So you can use that and explain it. Okay, now the problem, however, is that uh, uh, you could extend it, but what's the guarantee that that's a 2? Suppose this vertex was used only once, right? You came in once, you went out once. But this need not visit all the vertices in the set, right? You want a tool which visits all the vertices in the set, okay? Now, if this does not visit all the vertices in the set, if it leaves out a lot of vertices, then what they say is that if it left out the constant, so if it left, left out, if it did not visit these vertices, let me look at the dual variables around these vertices. If this is a large dual value, then I can use this dual value. Then I've not used this dual value so far. Then I can use this dual value to build another solution here. What is the other solution I'll build here? Another Eulerian subgraph in this part. Right? So I have an Eulerian subgraph going through this set. I have another Eulerian subgraph in this part, which, which spans all of this. I take the union of those two. That will be an Eulerian, connected Eulerian subgraph for the entire thing. Yeah? So uh, if there is a large dual value associated with it. And if there is not a large dual value associated with it, then sort of that means that uh, I am leaving out very few words. Yeah? And they would call these, I think they call these reducible sets. And uh, then it is almost like uh, these parts are actually visiting all the words. So there's more work required here. In fact, the second, the first paper here, uh, much of it is focused on how to uh, account for that small gray area, right? If there's a large fraction left out, great. If there's a one fourth fraction left out, great. I can take care of it by reversing like this. If there is nothing left out, then uh, it's, it's almost saying that, okay, uh, I can do this. There's nothing left out, nothing to be done. Right? Uh, I can just do that. But if there is like not really a constant fraction, but uh, and uh, still something left out, then they have to do a lot more work. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not have time to go into that. Okay. Um, so, um, <clears throat> So, but let me focus on uh, what if nothing is left. Uh, what if uh, nothing was left out? So, which means that you would then change this into this. Okay. And now you could do the same thing here. You could change this into that, and so on. Suppose we were nice everything. <coughs> nothing was left out. But then, how will I solve this problem that remains? Okay. Or what is this problem that remains? This is the known weighted asymmetric transition problem. Okay. So let me come to that, and that is. That was solved by Swenson in an earlier paper. So let me say what the node we get that means is from this. Okay. So node weighted is we are given some numbers on the nodes. Okay? And the length of this edge is just a number.
And now here the idea is roughly, okay, not exactly, but roughly of uses the idea that I showed you earlier of uh, finding a cycle cover and shrinking it and repeating the roster. Okay? So you find a cycle cover, you shrink these, and then you repeat. Now the problem is that you know, you're not able to, just the simple minded process, you're not able to build, uh, to say anything better than long end. <coughs> so they here they have something very clever. And uh, he says that, suppose I already shrunk, suppose these are already some Arabian subgraphs that I have. Okay, each one of these is Arabian. So let's say at some intermediate stage, I bunch, shrunk a bunch of things, I got some Arabian subgraphs. <coughs> this is the current picture. And now I want to build, I want to find another cycle going over these. So now I want to find another not cycle, but in particular it will be, in general it will be an Arabian subgraph. Or I'm just finding another cycle, but it could be, it could have been more complicated. That's what we are trying to do, right? So remember, in this earlier business, we had cycles. And we found cycles that were connecting these cycles and then built all in a subclass. We found another cycle connecting these and so on and on. So that's what the same thing we want to do now, except that we now want to say that the length of this cycle we want to bound it in a more clever, careful manner. And the way he uh, does this is he says, so this cycle is called alpha light. So, okay, so the way he does is, he associates a number with every vertex. What's the number that I associate with every vertex? That number is the contribution of that vertex to this bound. Right? So this, remember, this can be thought of, I can, I can break this value up in the following manner. I take a vertex and I look at all the edges incident to, let's say, going out of that vertex. Okay? And I and look at what the contribution of these edges is to the objective function. So that is just x, c, and e. So sum up over all of these. So this is summation x, c, and e. E belonging to delta v, or delta plus v, this is v. So let's call this the number, the lower bound associated with this word x, v. Right? So now you can see that the sum of the lower bounds on all vertices is the value of the LP summation. Right? So basically, LP summation could be divided up into individual vertices. And now these are the numbers you put down on each of these vertices, and you argue, so we we'll say that this two, or this Eulerian subgraph, this purple Eulerian subgraph I picked, is a nice one. By nice I mean what we, what he calls alpha light. If, so, an Eulerian subgraph is alpha light, if the length, if it's length, The length here of this subgraph, it's called the subgraph C, is at most the sum of the alpha times the sum of the lower bounds of the vertices. So v belonging to C over V. Okay? So we call this a nice tool. If its total length is, remember, we don't want to charge the length to the optimum value of one. That's too much, right? That's the we get on the optimum. So he's charging it to these individual vertices. Of course, that itself is not sufficient, and more work requires to be able to say that this is not too much of overcharging. But uh, you know, you, you have gathered that from the paper. But you know, you want to find such a tool. Not a tool, you want to find such a tool. And how is that done? Uh, How is this done? Uh, this is done by solving some kind of a circulation problem. This is a nice algorithmic idea from the, from the, the earlier paper. Um, you're given these ordinary subgraphs, and you want to connect them up. And not all of them connect into one, right? Remember, even in the earlier thing, you did not manage to connect all those pieces together into one in one step. Right? You connected some, and you connected some in the next step, and so on. So you want to connect them up. So you want to find that cycle, you can think of it as you want to find an Eulerian sum. You want to find a set of edges such that at least one of those edges crosses each of these 
So at least one of the edges goes across uh, each of these sets. And that edge of set of edges, so find an ordinary set of edges. Which cross each set. So you want to find an ordinary set of edges such that they together cross each of these sets. And uh, how is this solved? So you would start with the with the LP solution. In the LP solution, you have a fractional value going across the set of value one at least. Right? Remember where is that coming from? This one. So across this set, the sum of these x values is at least the one, going out as well as coming in. Yeah. And now the idea is, can you use this to extract this, uh, to extract the integer set of edges? And as I said, the idea is circulation. So you will think of this as a fractional flow. This thing, think, what is a circulation in a graph? A circulation in a graph is a, a flow with no source of same, right? So there's no source thing, so which means there's conservation at every node. And so there's no source thing here, there's conservation at every node, and there's one unit of flow coming in and going across each one of those. And now can we get an integer value out of it? Remember, with circulation we have here the fraction circulation. Can we get an integer value out of it? We can if the constraints we place on circulation are already in the constraints. And the integer constraints I'm going to place is that there may be integer value of 1 going out of this, integer value of 1 coming into this, and so on. So a small construction here that uh, helps him achieve this. So again, a very cute construction. But with that, he can um, build a circulation of value, such so that, uh, or build, find a set of edges, such so that at least one edge goes across each one of these sets. It's an orientation collection of edges. And the total cost of these edges is one. Uh, so this happens in this picture. Of course, there's more happening here. So once you build this, again, I'm charging these lower bound values. Why is that right? You know, will there be overcharging? All of those things have to be talked about. So you build this, you get a larger one, and you repeat. Right? Same idea that you gave for the long end. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I've not told you a whole lot, but. Uh, Hopefully, I've piqued your interest and you can uh, uh, try reading this paper. Uh, warning, you won't leave at least a month uh, of your time. It, need, uh, it, it requires a lot of effort um, because there's a lot of things happening here. I'm out of time. <laughs>